I'm outside Ultra Precision at Cranfield University. Now this is a very different story today. Here they design, develop and manufacture machine tools. Now these are really precision machine tools. In fact, these machines go beyond microns. MTD CNC, bringing you the latest engineering news via video media. Martin, you do something very different here at uh, Ultra Precision or this part Ultra Precision in Cranfield University. These are some of the parts that you have manufactured on machine tools that you've developed, correct? Yes, that's correct. Obviously, to prove the machine tools which we've uh, designed and developed, you have to make something for proof of that machine tool. So these are some of the uh, large science projects and uh, some commercial projects which we've manufactured on the machines we've developed. Okay, and engineers love seeing shiny componentry. So let, let, let's have a look at two of these. Let's start with this um, well, the, larger the, part of the top. This uh, large hemisphere is a thing called the Boltzmann sphere, or half of the Boltzmann sphere, and it's been developed for the National Physical Laboratory. Over the next uh, 10 to 12 years or so, all the system international units are going to be redefined, and this has been used to redefine the Kelvin. So this will be the new standard for measurement of temperature in the future and it's been machined to be accurate to one nanometer across its uh, diameter and that's been measured in nine different instrument methods. So you've had to develop a machine to produce this? Yes, that's correct. Uh, one of the main problems of machining anything to this sort of standard is uh, thermal control, uh, vibration control and obviously positional control and those aspects are certainly areas that here at Cranfield University, the Centre for Precision Engineering, we've developed techniques in over many, many years that enable us to do this level of machining. Very impressive. Let's have a look at the uh, second one you're going to show us, or the second component you're going to show us. Well, in a similar way, this is another large science project. This is a very small but very significant mirror surface for the James Webb Space Telescope. Now, we've produced here more surfaces than anybody else. Not the biggest ones, as you can probably tell, but certainly more of them. And there's 11 intersecting uh, surfaces here which enable the near-infrared measurement instruments in the James Webb Space Telescope to be packed very closely together. And this has been manufactured, so each surface is precise to seven nanometers. Again, pretty tight tolerances. Now, the, these, are, these are components, these two plus others, that you can't manufacture in uh, using traditional type of machine tools. So what you do here is develop the machine tool in order to make these parts. So let's go into your workshops and have a look at what happens in there. Martin, this is your biggest workshop. What, what do you undertake in here? This is where the larger machines are developed in here. It's a temperature controlled environment. Uh, we have large air blocks of granite to help with the vibration control and we develop the mechanics for large pieces of equipment. So uh, air bearing spindles, uh, con the control systems themselves. But we're doing it, we're trying to do it at least on a manufacturing scale. So these are large area systems. So that's why we need such a big space. You've got some automation in here. I mean, what's, what's the FANUC robo or the, the FANUC cell over here, the robotics? The FANUC cell is uh, an experiment and a test to do machine polishing using a traditional robotic arm. And again, it's about the control of that robot arm and the position of the head. So in itself, it's quite a standard uh, FANUC robot arm. But the control of its head, the rotation as well of the piece of glass, in that case, it's a glass usually it's worked on, and the accuracy of maintaining that position while developing a shape which is non-flat. So these are all aspherical surfaces and we're trying to get to around about the 10 nanometers of surface finish with that type of polishing technique. So somebody's come to you with a product that you need to achieve what you've just said and you've gone to the market to find the solutions coupled with your in intellect and intelligence here to be able to develop that solution. That's correct. I mean, there are so, for certain areas, there are existing solutions, but sometimes they're either too slow or they're too expensive or they're not suitable for a production process. So if you have a very, you can polish down to sort of nanometer levels, but the machinery for that is very expensive and not everyone needs that. And there's a big gap sometimes between the micron and the nanometer. So to fill that gap, we often get projects where there's a commercial imperative for either cost or speed of throughput. Often they're linked, of course. Uh, and that's what, the, that in, in the case of the FANUC robot, that sells. Now, you, you are doing some manufacturing in here as well. You're doing some single point turning on a machine. You, you would commercially buy these machines to aid you in your, in your development as well? 
Yeah, we have uh, several machines which are commercially uh, purchased, which are, as you say, single point diamond turning machines. Uh, and they help us develop some of the spindles, for example. So we don't have to develop a machine to make a spindle. We can buy a machine for that. If that's necessary, we do it. And also we can help other businesses who might not yet have access to that technology to see if these machines can be used for their requirements. So they can come here and rent it, if you like, effectively, or, or, or buy time on it, and we can manufacture a part they want just to see if it's possible before they then invest in their own machinery. We are talking about ultimate precision here, aren't we? I mean, you know, we, we visit many machine shops and they're machining to microns. But you're going beyond that. I mean, what does this machine behind us achieve when you're turning? Uh, the, the more nanotech machine uh, achieves around about uh, a half a micron, but we do have machines here which were developed under the Cranfield Unit Precision Engineering brand, uh, which can achieve down to uh, a nanometer, actually, of machine precision, and roughly around 10 nanometers, and just under that of uh, surface finish. So, so over the years, you yourselves would have developed this machinery, and then somebody would have bought the license to then sell the products into a market that they know? Yeah, we develop, sometimes we develop it and it's openly available because we are a university, so if it's developed openly, it's openly available. Sometimes if we're developing specifically for a company that then gets commercially, it's owned by that company. If we're developing for a company, they own it, they pay for it and they own it. If we develop in other things which have a commercial imperative, we might license it out. But often because, again, we're a university, we make those licenses incredibly low cost to access. One of your latest projects, the Loxon machine, let's go and have a look at that. Okay, let's do that. This certainly isn't a normal machine tool, is it, Martin? No, it's a, a very compact machine tool, a uh, single-point diamond-turning milling machine, and it's, uh, it's designed to have through, high throughput in a small volume, so to make it a much easier machine to use. So what's the product that you're actually developing this machine for? It's developed for small parts which have high volumes, so watch parts, uh, optics for laser uh, uh, guidance, etc., and a anywhere where you need better than sort of micron of precision but you need it in a high volume you're producing a lot of maybe of the same part and what about when you're looking to achieve that tolerance how does this machine maintain or not grow thermally or all the axis moving together you maintain that precision how does it all work it's got a very sophisticated internal thermal control and it also has a very small air volume of machining space and then on top of that, it has automated loading and unloading. So the, the space where the machining occurs isn't being continuously evacuated to the atmosphere. It's reasonably self-contained. It's not completely isolated, but it's well self-contained. And then it has thermal barriers in the machine at various places to maintain a high uh, thermal stability. In fact, the, the, the machine that supplies the, the uh, coolant in here can achieve a millikelvin of thermal stability of the fluid which gives around about 10 millikelvins of thermal stability in the machine itself. And then for vibration, it's not a m high mass machine like traditional single-point. you've still diamond. got axes moving in different directions. You've still got a lot of axes. You've got six axes moving in different directions. But this achieves its uh, positional precision by using dynamic feedback. It's continually reacting to the position of the workpiece and the tool on two linear trackways and a third in the Z direction and spindle speeds to continuously compensate for its motion and its position within the machining cycle. Now I think I know the answer to this but how much of all of this has been developed here? Virtually all of it actually, the, even the machine which uh, develops the very high control of the thermal uh, coolant. It's been developed under the EPSERC uh, funded project as this is, was our middle platform and so all the dynamic controls been developed here. We've got, very, as a university, we've got quite a lot of uh, papers published on, on the dynamic control and the stability of this system. And, and what will happen once this machine is proven and it's a success in somebody's production environment? Would I be able to buy this type of technology as an engineer in the UK? As part of our project, we do have to have a commercialization route for each of the three platforms we developed. And in the case of this one, it's been spun out into a company called Loxham Precision. So this is now called the Micro 4 Machining Center from Loxham Precision. And you can buy it with various options on there, including the automated loader, unloader. Uh, it's got an automated tool changer, which was developed under an Innovate UK program as well. Now, as a, a developer and a designer of machine tools, when you come to buy one commercially, you obviously know what's the best for you and, and, and that happened here did it with this Kern? Yeah several years ago we bought the Kern to help us with projects that uh, we didn't 
it, sometimes our machines are very precise, but they're quite slow because of that precision. So we need something which was faster, has things which the older machines don't have, such as the automated tool changer. And when we talk about speed, I mean, how fast is this current? It's got a uh, spindle speed of around about 50,000 RPM on, on the main uh, turning uh, drive. And what would you be machining here on this? We do a lot of the, we use carbide tools sometimes rather than diamond on this as well. And so we can do hardened steels for molds, for micro molding, for injection, micro injection molding. And also we can do different metals on this than we can do with our single point diamond turning, although we can put a single point diamond turn tool in here as well. And, and do you recognise the quality of this machine as a result of your knowledge on building machine tools? Absolutely, you know, Kern are, are definitely one of the, of the global leaders in the high precision machine tool manufacturing in the world and it's a sort of machine that we, we wouldn't even you know, try to compete with if, we were, if people wanted the level of precision and the technology that's available in this machine. And it's a multi-axis machine, isn't it? It's a five, five axis or is it seven axis? It's a seven axis one, actually. It's, it's, uh, I'm not sure we always use all seven <laughs> axes, in fairness, but it, it has that facility at least. And the machine's not running at the moment, so you're, you're not using it in a production environment, are you? But, but it is capable of that. It is capable of that, and this is a machine designed for a production environment. We're a university, so we don't have a production throughput like a traditional uh, jobbing machine shop would have. So we use it for you know, speciality projects, as I say, like micro-molding tools, for making parts for other machines we're building because of its relatively high throughput compared to some of the more precise but uh, slower machines. We use this quite a lot for making our own parts. And you can get these machines from Rainford Precision in the UK? We certainly buy all our tools from Rainford Precision and I think this one actually did come from Arthur Turner at Rainford Precision, so yeah, there you go. And this is a great example in here of machines that you've, you've developed years ago and you're now using them to make parts for new machinery. Yeah, indeed, we, we're using this one in particular, very large, it's probably the largest currently still in use in the world single point diamond turning machine for making parts for our own machines and parts for big science projects and there's a small machine behind you there which is probably one of the most precise in the world today because of its thermal and its positional control and we make gain mirrors for James Webb Space Telescope and the Boltzmann Sphere on that and we also make our own spindles on that machine as well so we're using the machines we've developed. And, and when were they developed? How, how are we going back a decade or even further? This one, even further, this one was developed in, uh, towards the end of the 1970s specifically to make the UK's independent nuclear deterrent or to, to make machines that could do that. So uh, what would that turn to now? Now this can turn over 1.6 metres to around about 10 microns of uh, precision. Uh, the one behind, as I say, can get, can get down to nanometres in the, under the right control conditions. Yeah. And now these machines are available to, to purchase via a supplier, are they? Maybe not in the UK, but somewhere in the, around yeah, the Yeah, I'm not sure <laughs> if anybody could possibly still manufacture this machine, but the one behind you is available actually from a, a cr company called Cranfield Precision, but it's owned by Five Cinetics now. We're going to conclude our tour today here, Martin, in this workshop. What, what does this department do? In here we have our large area coordinate measurement uh, metrology system, we have our large area grinding uh, machine and we also have our reactive atom plasma figuring. In this area we tend to deal mostly with the glasses, we do large glass parts in, in this department. Now this is some CMM, this is huge. Yeah, I mean, is it one of, the, one, of the, it's one of the biggest I've seen, is it one of the biggest that's available? It's one of the biggest in the UK, that's for sure. And, uh, Certainly of this type with the solid base, it's the, it's the largest. And the thing we've actually adapted this for is, again, higher precision. So we can measure roughly to a micron over this volume, and it's about three by two by one and a half meter volume on there. So you're getting some pretty good, uh, you're measuring some pretty tight tolerances there. Now this machine is obviously a bought machine, uh, the, the lights machine from Hexagon yeah. in Intelligence. Um, the other machines here, are they again partly machines that you've developed in the past that you're now bringing through to use for your manufacturing processes as well? Yeah, the, major the majority of the machines are. The, the grinding machine, the box grinder, is certainly one we developed under a research council project. That's now commercialised through IBS Precision uh, in Holland. And we have a, a large reactive atom plasma figuring machine, which was initially commercialised in the United States, but the machine itself was brought back to the UK for further development. And the compact grinder you're talking about is the one behind you here? The one behind me here, yeah. And, and why are you calling this compact? 
It's compact because although it's three by two meters, it can actually operate on pieces which are not much smaller than that. So it can operate on glasses of 1.6 meter di uh, diameter. So it's, it's compact in comparison to the piece it's working on. In itself, it's quite large. You, you've got a great team here. How many, how many people are at Ultra Precision? We've got a staff complement of around about 20 people in the precision engineering group here at Cranfield, and then we have around 12 or so uh, PhD researchers, and then we have a shared uh, cohort of MSc students across the, the whole of the materials and manufacturing department, so that can vary uh, up to 1,000 a year, but not all of them are here in precision. And is it quite exciting, because you don't really know what projects are coming next, do you? I mean, uh, all kinds of things could, you could be approached to make machinery for. It, it, there's two levels of excitement actually. One is the large science projects that we get, like the extremely large telescope European segments we're doing. Uh, and the other is that we're very heavily connected to commercial companies like Hexagon who helps us with this uh, machine and IBS with the... So we do get our students, are very fortunate, they do get real industrial experience even though they're developing research projects. This is my first time at Cranfield today and I, I didn't know that this existed to this degree so it's been a pleasure thanks for your time thank you it's my pleasure and unfortunately most people don't realize what's behind the door <laughs> hopefully they will now <laughs> thank you i hope so too